Hey everybody, so today we're gonna to finish talking about the amendments. We're gonna go, go through each one of them. Uh, so uh, we finished with the 21st Amendment, which repealed the 18th Amendment. Uh, today we're gonna to go 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, which to you guys doesn't mean anything right now because it's just random numbers. But each one of these have a very specific story uh, and it's, it's really cool. So it's a bunch of little mini stories today because every amendment has its own uh, story that kind of tells you about the American culture of, of what led to it. Uh, so I, th I think you're gonna like this today. Uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. So the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, and 27th amendments. Uh, so we're gonna start today talking about the 22nd amendment. So the 22nd amendment passed in 1951 uh, says no person shall be elected to the office of the president more than twice. No person who has held the pro office of, of president or acted as president for more than two years of a term, which some other person was elected president shall be elected to the office of the president more than once. But this article shall not apply to any person holding the office of president when this article was proposed by Congress. Um, so, uh, it almost sounds like a really difficult word problem. Like if Bobby's going, you know, this way and Sally's going this way on a train at 17 miles an hour at what wind speed. Uh, it's really not that complicated. Uh, what this means and making it as complicated as possible is presidents can only serve two terms, um, or 10 years. So if you like take over for somebody and there's like a year left in their term, so you've only served one year, uh, you can then serve two terms of your own and bring it your total to nine years. Uh, but it basically says you can't serve more than two terms as the president. Now, why would that be? Because of this guy. You recognize him? You may or you may not. Uh, now, if you're just like a history person, like, I know exactly who that is. Uh, that is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Do you remember Franklin Delano Roosevelt? We talked about him uh, yesterday or in our last lesson. Uh, when he ran against Herbert Hoover and they moved up the inauguration, so that he could become president. That happened <laughs> at the start of the Great Depression. This is a picture of him in color. He has been president for so long. He made it all the way through the Great Depression. He is going to be the president during World War II that color photography comes out while he is the president. All right. Uh, FDR is the only president we've ever had. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, people call him FDR. He's the only president we've ever had that was elected four consecutive times to the presidency. Uh, in 1932, he comes in and they move the inauguration up for him. In 1936, he wins re-election, wins on a landslide in both of these. No president had ever served more than two terms, in large part, and the main reason is George Washington didn't serve more than two terms, and George Washington said he didn't think a president should serve more than two terms. Uh, FDR may have stepped down um, after two terms if it was relatively normal at the time. However, FDR saw World War II was already starting up in Europe. Uh, America, we won't get involved in World War II until 1941, but FDR feels like it's his responsibility to keep being the president because he steered America through the Great Depression and if World War II happens, he wants to, to be there for that as well. FDR is very, very popular uh, at the time. So uh, FDR wins his third term in 1940. Uh, World War II uh, is taken off. Uh, in 1944, he runs for a fourth term as president. Now, FDR had already had polio. FDR is in a wheelchair when he was elected in 1932, all right? So, uh, you know, he's not the healthiest guy uh, around. Um, in 1944, he is already struggling with his health. Uh, he ends up getting polio a second time uh, during his fourth term in office, and he's going to die uh, as a president in uh, 1945, one year into his fourth term in office, uh, from a stroke, which is, was a complication from polio. Uh, so after FDR dies, all right, and everybody liked FDR, Harry Truman takes over for him, all right? Harry Truman's gonna, I'm gonna talk about history, he's the guy that made the decision to drop the atomic bomb. Um, off, off the, uh, uh, off the reservation on that one. But, uh, so um, the amendment, the 22nd amendment is no third term. Even though everybody liked FDR, 
it was really weird when he was no longer the president. Uh, Harry Truman took over, uh, which was the vice president. Uh, it was kind of the, the agreed upon thing that would happen. But people were so used. This guy had been president for over a decade, uh, uh, for uh, quite a while, for 13 years at that point. People struggled to kind of move on from that and realized if you just keep letting people get elected, it's almost like you could have like a king or set a, a dangerous precedent. So the 22nd Amendment says you can only serve two terms. Even though nobody really had a problem with FDR doing it, they realized it it was a lot smoother when we knew they were done after two terms. So they made it an official amendment after FDR uh, that you can't serve more than two terms. Even though they didn't have a problem with FDR doing it, once they really sat down and thought about it, they thought th this, this could set a bad precedent moving forward of people just serving as long as they can. Um, so the question here is what had uh, been taking place prior to the 22nd Amendment that made it necessary to limit a president to only two terms? Specifically talking about uh, FDR uh, uh, serving four terms, uh, being elected four times. That, that, that uh, precedent set by George Washington basically got shattered and now other politicians would be wanting to do that. Um, so, and that's the question, why had no one prior to FDR ever served more than two terms if it wasn't illegal? Uh, it's respecting the original G-dub. Uh, George Washington didn't serve more than two terms. They didn't. So the 22nd Amendment uh, is going to limit the president to only being able to serve two terms. All right. Uh, the 23rd Amendment. <laughs> I'll read it to you. The district con uh, constituting the seat of the government of the United States shall appoint in such a matter as Congress may direct a number of electors of president and vice president equal to the whole number of senators and representatives in Congress to which the district would be entitled if it were a state, but in no event more than at least populous state. What? Does this help you at all? Probably not. That's supposed to be the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. Here's what this unique amendment does, which is the 23rd Amendment. So here's a map. That's a map of America. You see that thing that's zoomed in on? All right. Uh, let me move, move my mouse over here to show you. All right. So I said, let me move my mouse over here and show you. All right. So uh, if you, so this square here, if you zoom in on that, see this red little area right there? Do you know what that is? That is Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Uh, is a city. This is where the you know House of Representatives and Senate stuff that we're going to go into detail about uh, uh, here in future lessons about what that is. That's all in the city of Washington, D.C. So Washington, D.C., which was land gifted by George Washington, uh, is the capital of the United States. Since the, we have federalism and the federal government and the state governments have to work together and one can't be stronger than the other. If Washington, D.C., if the capital of the United States was inside a state, that state could basically control that city and therefore control the national government. So they knew this initially. Like you, you can't have the federal government inside a city that's controlled by a state because that would just cause an issue. So Washington, D.C., that little red dot there uh, on, on the uh, edge of the Potomac, all right, that is not in a state. On one side of it, uh, below it, that's Virginia. Above it is Maryland. Washington, D.C. is just in no man's land. It is not inside a state. So that a state can't basically control the federal government. That makes sense. However, Washington, D.C. is a big city. You know, this is where, where your capital is. A lot of people live there. The problem is the Electoral College. If you remember, the Electoral College says that the states get to vote for the president. People in Washington, D.C., up to this point, up to 1961, could not vote for the president because they had no electoral votes because they weren't a state. So they can't even vote for the president. So they are citizens of the United States, but because they live in the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., since they live there, they are not allowed to vote for the president. It, it, everybody kind of realizes that that's, that's messed up. So they make a specific amendment, which is the 23rd Amendment, which says, all right, well, we understand that that's kind of that's kind of jacked up there. So uh, you guys get to vote for the president. And they just make an amendment. They, they get like one or two votes. Um, I think we get uh, 
yeah, one or, or, or two votes, I, I, I believe, towards uh, the president, uh, specifically because all Americans should, uh, should have a right to vote for the president. Uh, so that happens in, in 1961. Uh, so that's moving on now to the 24th Amendment. If you remember, when we had talked about the 15th Amendment, if you off the top of your head right now are like, 15th Amendment, I know what that is, and you can tell me that's great. If you can't, don't panic. I'm going to tell you. Think about it. All right, 15th Amendment, after the Civil War, gave African Americans the right to vote. All right? African-American men. And then, then we've come up with the 19th Amendment. So uh, everybody, uh, uh, black people, white people of all races can vote in the United States coming up to 1964. So, yay, well, great, that problem got solved, right? No, 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 no. Um, we're going to talk some about that, uh, quite a bit of this, about that in this course. Um, black people, specifically in the South, were being prevented from being able to vote. Now, you can't say black people have this rule put on them to, that prevents them from voting because uh, the 14th Amendment says everybody has, you know, all citizens are equal. So what had been happening in the South is the South had been creating poll taxes, making everybody that showed up to vote for the president or vice president or, or pretty much any office, you had to pay a tax before you could vote. Now, that already negatively impacted black people because black people aren't allowed the same jobs at the time as white people are that are as good of paying. So the poorest part of your population was black people. So it automatically focused on black people. To make it even worse, the South, knowing there's a lot of poor white people that they do want to vote, would add in things like the grandfather clause, which says if your grandfather could vote, then you don't have to pay a poll tax. And the only people whose grandfather could vote would be white people. So by finagling these laws and these workarounds, they are basically making black people pay to vote, which is the poorest part of the population. This is a very effective way of preventing black people from being able to vote in the South, in areas that they are the majority of the population, uh, have almost no ability to vote because of things like the poll tax. The Civil Rights Movement really takes off in the 1950s and 1960s. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, there's a lot of things that take place in the 1950s and 1960s with the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, in 1964, Lyndon B. Johnson uh, has a Voting Rights Act, uh, or the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the 24th Amendment is passed, which says, you cannot have a poll tax. Like, no, you, you are an American, you get to vote for who gets to be an American, who gets to represent you. You don't have to pay for that privilege. So uh, the poll taxes are done away with, with uh, the, the, uh, the 24th Amendment. So the question here is what group of people were directly negatively affected by, uh, by poll taxes is, is African Americans. Uh, and why was this? They're the poorest part of the population. They're, they're trying to uh, be prevented from voting. So you, this seems like a pretty cut and dry. No poll tax. That's fine. The reason is you can't, you shouldn't have to pay or you cannot make somebody pay in order to vote. So this is what has come up here, uh, uh, recently as this is being recorded is this idea of mandating people have valid IDs in order to vote, right? Now, the only, the one way it can connect to the 24th Amendment is, uh, some states, I think North Carolina, and I could be wildly wrong on this and I'm going to make a fool of myself, uh, to go get a driver's license or an ID is not free. Now, I would fully believe that it was not free. And then one of my students told me like last semester, like, Mr. Wax, if you can get a free ID, which completely defeats the, the argument here that I, people make. Anyway, uh, so if it's free, it kind of goes against it. But if you have to pay to have an official state ID and you have to have that ID in order to vote, then you are making people pay to vote, which would violate the 24th Amendment, so uh, the, the voter ID. So I, I have heard that uh, argument, but when my uh, one of my students was saying that you can get an ID, I don't know about a driver's license, but like an ID and get that free, uh, that would eliminate that part of the argument. But the whole voter ID, what we will talk about that uh, uh, later on in this course as well. Um, all right. So... Uh, Pause me on that last question if you need to. 25th Amendment, 1967. Man, you talk, let, let, me, let me read it to you because 
that's your, the most exciting part of your day. I know it is. Uh, when, uh, so section four, whenever the vice president and the majority of either the principal officers of the executive departments of such other bodies of Congress may by law provide, transmit to the president pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of the Representatives, their written declaration that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. All right, that is one part of the 25th Amendment. It, it's section four. All right, there's section one, two, and three. Let's talk about this for a second, all right? About the 25th Amendment. You're like, well, I don't even know what we just read. You're fine. All right, go ahead and explain it to you. The 25th Amendment uh, really clarifies everything. And part one, part two, and part three are straightforward. Everybody's like, okay, that makes sense. The 25th Amendment clarifies what happens if a president dies, all right? Now, this happened in 1967. This was passed because in 1963, John F. Kennedy, who was our president, was assassinated. Immediately, his vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson, who's in this picture here, uh, the, the, the woman to his left that's closest to the camera, that's Jackie Onassis Kennedy. That's JFK's wife, who was sitting next to him in a car when JFK got shot. She still, you can't tell if it's a black and white uh, uh, photo, but she still has like JFK's blood on her as the vice president is being sworn in as the new president. So... A few years later, they get together and they want to clarify what happens when the president dies. Because this has happened a couple times, all right, at, at this point. President dies, vice president takes over, like, what happens with these positions? So everybody gets together and they kind of make that, they don't kind of, it's an amendment to the Constitution that the 25th Amendment says, okay, president goes down, vice president becomes the, uh, the president. And, like, and then they, they start ranking, all right, with the president and vice president go down, here's who steps up. Like, they kind of rank it on what happens if the president dies? Um, and generally what the 25th Amendment was is just agreeing with and officially making it the part of the Constitution, something that had already been happening, where the vice president becomes the president. Um, it's not a huge deal. However, however, the part that gets talked about all the time with the 25th Amendment is exhausting. I couldn't even find good pictures. I'm going through trying to find pictures and it's all politics. Because that section four that I read you, because like section one's like, oh, president dies, vice president becomes president. Like it's pretty straightforward. There is a part in there in uh, the 25th Amendment, and it wasn't put in there for any nefarious reason. Uh, they probably just said, hey, what if this happens? All right. Um, so what happens, say, the president doesn't die, but he has a severe stroke and he can't carry out the duties of the office. Uh, you know, he, he got a really bad car accident. He, he's on life support. I'm, I'm going real dark on this, aren't I? Uh, he, he, he's, he's in a coma where he can't do, do the job. Well, what happens in that case? He's not dead. So what happens? Like, all right, well, what's going to happen is all the people around him get vote whether he can do his job appropriately or not. And if they all vote, like his cabinet and all those other people, they all vote that no, he can't, then... They just make the vice president the president. That's pretty much their intention. Oh, well, with the wording of it, if the president's crazy and he's just not good at his job, in theory, these have to be like the president's like advisor, like the, the people that support the president. If they all vote and basically kick him out of office, every president that we have now, they're like, invoke the 25th Amendment, because the people who don't like him, because uh, they're like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. He's, you know inept. He, he can't do it with, uh, you know, 25th Amendment because uh, the 25th Amendment, if everybody around you votes you like, yeah, you aren't competent enough to do this job, they can kick you out of office. Uh, it has never happened. It's never seriously been considered uh, that I am aware of, and it's definitely never happened. Um, but uh, for, for just like incompetence or people disagree with, with your decisions, you, but you see it all the time politically. Uh, and it that's not really a thing that I imagine would happen but since i'm recording this and this is like stuck forever on the internet uh would not be the first time i'm wrong on something all right so the question here is what part of the 25th amendment gets talked about a bunch and has never seriously been considered and why do you think that obscure part of the amendment was added we kind of talked about that like uh what part of the 25th amendment they always talk about and why why do they do it and we just got done talking about it so pause me uh Answer this completely, and then don't pause me, we'll move on. All right, the 26th Amendment. Now, this one gets gets pretty So This isn't, you know, a little politics, oh, who's going to lose a job? This, this one, to me, I think is, is, is a pretty 
uh, intense one uh, that happened. The 26th Amendment says, comes out in 1971, the right of citizens of the United States who are 18 years of age or older to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States by any state on account of age. The Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The 26th Amendment lowers the voting age from 21 years old to 18 years old in the United States. All right. Now, because the original, I mean, in the Constitution, it says you, you got to be 21. And But something has happened. In the late 60s and early 70s, aggressively tried to lower the voting age. That thing was the Vietnam War. All right. So the Vietnam War is America is going to another country and trying to fight them because they don't want them to be communists. People couldn't didn't know where Vietnam was on the map. All they know is a lot of people are getting sent over there. I, I, I guess you could say against their will because America has something called the draft. Right, most countries do. This is it's literally like a lottery. It's called the lottery. Like these guys spinning this and those balls in there, and this is on national TV. If they pull out the ball and it's got your birthday on it, everybody in the country with that birthday just got drafted. Oversimplifying, but that, but that, that's that, that's what, and they would draft you. All right. Do you know how old you had to be to be drafted? Eighteen years old. You know how old you had to be to vote? Twenty-one years old. That frustrated a bunch of people. People did not like the fact that you could be sent to die for your country by somebody who you weren't even old enough to vote for. This next picture uh, is a very famous picture that kind of associated. This is a, an actual Vietnam soldier, all right? 18 years old. This young man is old enough to go around the world, fight for America, and die for America but he's not old enough to vote for the people who are choosing to send him there. That is a strong argument. And the war becomes so unpopular and people are so angry that there is a huge push to, if somebody's old enough to die for the country, if they're old enough to take an M16 to the other side of the world, defend America and die for the country, they should be old enough to vote for the people making the decision to send them there. That's a hard one to argue with. And I think uh, the government realized in 1971 the war is uh, uh, getting ready to start winding down. Not surprising when you let all the 18-year-olds vote. They're like, oh, uh, end the war. Um, that it really, it, it really clicked home that, yeah, that having being able to be drafted at 18 but can't vote till 21, that's too much of a gap. So the, the 26th Amendment absolutely... Uh, uh, was designed so that people that were drafted ha have a right to vote. And that's why the voting age today is still 18. So the question here is, what was the reason for the 26th Amendment? What was happening at this point in history that led to the 26th Amendment? Uh, so pause me, answer that in two complete sentences, uh, and then we'll move on. All right, the 27th Amendment. This is the last one. <clears throat> so you go from 1971 to 1992. Uh, so it's been, at this point, uh, 30 years since there's been an amendment to the Constitution, right? Uh, so the 27th Amendment is, kind of, is, is obscure. You know, we start like the 11th Amendment. Like, this is a kind of an obscure one, but it makes sense. Uh, so Congress gets paid. If you're a congressman, a federal, federal government person, you get paid. And you get paid uh, pretty well. So this is in 1992 uh, uh, when this uh, came out. Uh, it's 35,000 seems a little high for 1992. Maybe this graphic. Anyway, Congress people make good money. Like here, uh, $35,000, uh, uh, average America in income. Congress make 158,000. That's top 5%. You know who gives Congress pay raises? Congress. Congress is like, you know what we deserve? What? Pay raise. I like it. Pay raise. All right. So, because it had gotten kind of ridiculous, this this gap, Congress in 1992, a uh, whole bunch of new people had come into Congress in 1992. Uh, so Congress actually makes this amendment on themselves, which, right, Congress, good on you. Uh, Congress makes an amendment. It's the last one that, that's gotten passed, the 27th Amendment, that says Congress cannot vote themselves a pay raise. Now, they get they the, the same process takes place as it always does. 
they go through, they create a, uh, you know, the pay raise, yes, good, and they can vote it through and they have a pay raise. However, pay raises do not take, uh, do not take place until the, after the next election. So yeah, they can vote for a pay raise, but it doesn't take place until after the, the next election. So you actually have to be like reelected to get that pay raise. Uh, so the 27th Amendment just says if Congress gives itself a pay raise, it doesn't take place until after the next election. This way they can't just you know, give themselves money. They have to at least get reelected for that to happen. Uh, <clears throat> so th uh, that's the uh, question here. How does the 27th Amendment prevent Congress from giving themselves a pay raise? Uh, answer that in complete sentences. Uh, and that's as far as we're going to get today. And uh, I will see you guys tomorrow. Mm -hmm.